Uh, but uh, so basically the one of the recommendations for uh, presenting was uh, how to do some of the more weird edge casey things in WSL. And uh, I decided I'd uh, jump on that. So hopefully the demo gods will uh, uh, smile down on me and uh, things won't go too badly here. So we'll, we'll see where we go here. Uh, a little bit about me. Uh, I'm a software developer by day, a sleep deprived dad by night. Uh, also part of the reason why the, this is less uh, polished than what it could have been because somebody kept waking up on me. Uh, I do have a website and social media stuff. I, I'm on that uh, bird site as long as I don't have to pay a buck a year. Uh, once the, that, that might be a buck too far for what value I get out here in a little bit. But till then, yeah, uh, you, you can find me everywhere. And I still somehow maintain uh, the presidency. Uh, we probably need to have an election at some point here. Uh, so if anyone wants to arm wrestle, I, I promise I, I'm a weakling. <laughs> uh, otherwise, I do hear there are openings in the U.S. Uh, House uh, if you're wanting to move up in your, your aspirations. But a little too soon. Like <laughs> yeah. Uh, sure. <laughs> so what are we going to talk about tonight? Uh, I'm going to start with a little brief history of uh, WSL talk about the latest new shiny updates that uh, mostly are beta sort of pre-release uh, sort of stuff that half of it you have to have uh, insiders install so your um, OS and I, I like my computer too much to live on it that far on the edge. So yeah, that's not, some of those we'll just talk about. Uh, we'll try installing XOR in WSL which it already is, so that, that's a real easy demo. Uh, and then getting XRDP to actually uh, remote desktop into WSL then may actually use a real Linux desktop if you don't like this whole Linux, Windows thing. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about SSH uh, and running a server and why you can, but it, it won't be very helpful until you get that latest uh, uh, pre-release network stuff all sorted out and then we'll give a try at USB over IP uh, following Microsoft's directions on how to take a USB thing from your Windows host and actually get it to run inside of uh, WSL Linux. So first just a quick intro on what hardware we're running on here. Uh, this is a Windows 11 Pro uh, running version 21 H2. Uh, it's an i7 6600U uh, uh, laptop uh, CPU, and yes, if you look, I know Windows 11 and uh, that CPU don't seem like they should work together, but hey, guys, uh, I, I don't see anything. Uh, it's running with 20 gigs of RAM, and uh, the WSL version is 2.0.0.0. Uh, so at least until we run the update command here, and I think there's like two or three point releases that have happened since then, and it's running Windows kernel or Linux uh, kernel 5.15.123.1-1. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that as well here. So a real brief history of uh, uh, the subsystems of Windows. Uh, early on in Windows NT, there was uh, several of them, uh, POSIX, OS2, and Win32. And uh, basically, that would allow you to do uh, run like Win32 programs or POSIX sort of stuff. And uh, even though it was running a completely different OS than what it was intended to be. Uh, and uh, these were uh, basically implemented as user mode modules that uh, sent and passed along the appropriate NT system calls. Uh, so they were basically a shim in between the, the actual Win32 application and the, the actual real uh, OS. And uh, basically um, it, it allowed you to do anything uh, and make it run in uh, Windows NT. 
basically, when your user mode application got launched, the motor invoked the right subsystem and satisfied your application dependencies. And uh, then basically later on, the POSIX layer uh, got replaced with uh, what they called the uh, subsystem for Unix-based applications, FUA. And uh, even that now is kind of defunct. But um, basically, it uh, did all sorts of fun stuff like that. And basically, the whole idea was that they could get all those old things that were running on Unix uh, to be easily ported over and run in the Windows world for like servers and uh, all of the Linux app or Unix applications so that the developer, you didn't have to have a developer rewrite it all the way. And uh, that way they, they could sell themselves as more value added. Uh, but uh, they basically what, what would happen is uh, they, they had like uh, uh, user mode uh, that, that Jim would then call into the kernel mode stuff for like fork and all of those various different uh, commands and make it look like it was still running in that Unix-based world. Uh, so uh, over time, though, they in, uh, retired these subsystems, and uh, but the, the sort of architecture of being able to do it inside of the NT kernel, which is what we all still are running if you're running Windows, uh, sort of still made it easy so that when WSL came along, they, they were able to easily just sort of shoehorn it in there. So uh, WSL uh, one basically was a, uh, again, sort of bizarro land uh, shim that uh, let you run uh, L64 binaries on Windows. It uh, had both a user mode and kernel mode components. And it basically uh, it was made up of a user mode session manager service that uh, basically managed it, the, the life cycle. Uh, Pico provided drivers like uh, LXSS and LX Core that emulated a Linux kernel, and it just straight up translated Linux syscalls into uh, Windows NT uh, kernel calls. And then also there was a whole Pico process that was unmodified user mode stuff like bin bash and that stuff that you thought it was running inside of Linux. Uh, and it ba basically what ended up happening was uh, it worked for the most part, but kind of like Pet Cemetery, sometimes things came back wrong. And uh, it, it would work for the stuff that they implemented, and but you were at the mercy of Microsoft on updating everything. So how did it work? Uh, here, if I click right, uh, they basically you can see that there was this uh, user mode uh, bash.exe, and uh, it was running inside of uh, Windows land, and it basically called in and actually, uh, it, it was very complicated and just uh, sort of a bizarre land version of Linux, essentially, where City. You, you were basically running it virtually and it was everything was emulated. It was sort of like the uh, anti-wine of the world. So uh, also note there was uh, two separate file systems. There was the VOIFS, which was, uh, it had full Linux support. You could do all the permissions, all the, the chmod stuff that you know and love, symlinks work, and you could also have non-legal file names and it was basically all of ETC, bin, user, all the stuff that if it didn't play like Linux, it was definitely not going to work well. Um, and then there was the drive FS, which was uh, uh, basically interoperable with Windows. It required legal Windows file names, relied on Windows security, and it was not linux -y at all. So uh, move on to uh, basically it worked, but it wasn't great and performance really was uh, hurting. So uh, they came out with WSL2 shortly after that. And uh, as you can see, it uh, basically is a, a full VM 
it, it's running a full kernel. It's it's all really really Linux. And uh, if you want to move stuff back and forth, we'll talk about how you can actually mount stuff from Windows or Linux and transfer files across. But performance is rough. But we'll get to that here in a minute. How does it work? Basically, like I was hinting, it's leveraging the hypervisor to run a real small, tiny mean, uh, Linux kernel. And uh, that's where you're then running the, uh, uh, like your Ubuntu or your Debian or Arch or whatever. And uh, then basically there's a inner process communication back and forth that lets you look into that. And so it's running as a guest uh, inside of uh, hypervisor VM, basically. As I said, it's a full kernel. Uh, there's definitely some big improvements. Um, like, for example, if you want to unzip a file, it's 20 times faster, two to five times faster than using when you're using like Git or NPM or CMake, and there's no translations going on. Um, and uh, so you can get away with doing full things like Docker, or any of your updates to the Linux kernel. Uh, Microsoft runs them in uh, Windows Update, but they don't really have to do much work. They just grab and uh, chuck uh, and can access your Windows fi file system. Like I said, uh, it's using a weird thing uh, from uh, Plan 9 OS called 9T. And it's basically a really simple uh, network file uh, transfer protocol. And uh, why didn't they just use Samba? Well, number one, Samba, uh, they couldn't rely that it was going to be run uh, uh, running on the, the guest OS, as well as uh, if they shipped it along to get around that issue. Well, now they just uh, poison things because it's uh, uh, GPL licensed and they, they didn't want to have to mess with that so they rolled their own using plan nine and uh partially because they already had the code existing from other projects and it's just really simple but of course if you're trying to do certain big complex things things go wrong uh for example if you like try and open uh, a git repo in the linux side of things from windows uh, in like uh, Git Kraken or something like that, it would just straight up pop up a message saying, no, no, don't do this. No, it's going to end badly. You can go forward, but you're not going to be happy. I, I've also found if you're using VS Code and trying to do uh, uh, .NET build sort of stuff, you, you're going to have a bad time. Um, compiling and using NuGet and all those things, it, you just it's bad, don't do it. Basically, it uses lots of small files. Yep. And anything that relies on uh, file permissions and file locking and all those things don't work well at all. So it works, but don't make a habit out of it. I find WSL works the best if you treat it just like it's its own separate uh, machine. I definitely do not follow that piece of advice. And it definitely just comes with it. Yeah. <laughs> it, it will work great up until the point that it doesn't. And uh, especially if you use it um, over the period of multiple days and you're like doing a bunch of IO heavy stuff, you're, you'll find that stuff will just slowly grind to a halt and stop working. And then you get yelled at because why, why doesn't any of this stuff work? You're, you're an idiot, et cetera. A whole other HR related sort of problem, but hey, that's a discussion for another day. Uh, and yeah, so then you reboot, everything gets better. But uh, so the good news is they are still actively developing this and they have fixed some of the problems. There's a whole big long list of them, uh, but in this uh, 2023 September update, uh, they they have fixed the uh, a bunch of uh, uh, of the bugs uh, where like the WSL service uh, .exe would just randomly crash 
Uh, they also now, if plan nine file mounts uh, have an IO error, it will retry. Uh, they did update the, uh, the WSL curl. And then also uh, WSL GUI apps now have windows snapping. So if you roll down the windows and hit the arrow key, it will snap to one corner of the window, uh, which is real fun to see XI's uh, lose its mind like that. <laughs> We'll play with that here in a minute. Let's see what was this one? X size. Uh, there, there's a fun XOR uh, application that you can run. That's just a little set of eyes that will follow your mouse around. It's a great way to test and see if you have X actually running and working. But uh, so the exciting part, though, is the experimental features. Uh, one of the the big ones is auto memory reclaim. Uh, you have two options. Uh, gradual or drop cache. Basically gradual, uh, after five minutes of you not using that memory chunk, it will start to return it back to the Windows host. Uh, and it will take over the space of 30 minutes. So like say you, uh, someone has a comment, uh, especially fun uh, working with small files being synced to SharePoint or OneDrive. Yeah, that's yeah. You're gonna have a bad time. That sounds like a lot. Everybody's trying to do everything at the same time. Yeah, uh, but yeah. So anyway, the audio memory you're playing. Say you have a three gigabyte uh, hunk of memory that your uh, VM is using at the moment. Uh, basically, what will happen is uh, over the space of three thirty minutes, it will return itself back down to nothing. And so 100 megabytes worth of RAM a minute will return back to uh, the parent uh, uh, Windows machine. Uh, that This feature does require you to disable C groups version one in, uh, inside of WSL. And uh, it does require it to be on WSL two. Uh, the big call outs are if you're using something that needs C groups to behave and play nice, like say if you're running Dr. Damon, uh, it won't work for you because that that is a current issue where it will break uh, do, the Dr. Damon. So uh, the other option you have is drop cache, which uh, it would just eat the memory straight back into Windows all at once rather than uh, gradually. So I mean, that does give you the, the chance that it's gonna thrash back and forth more often versus uh, returning it gradually, but it does also, you don't have to wait for, like say if you're doing some big weird memory thing that's taking up gigabytes of memory and then you're done with it, you don't have to wait for that gradual return back to normalcy. Um, it just all comes back at the same time. Um, there's also uh, auto disk space cleanup. So if you have your uh, virtual uh, disk that you're running Linux in and you delete a whole bunch of stuff, if you clean that up and give you back your disk space, it does it sparsely. Uh, there's some fun networking stuff that we'll talk about here in a minute, uh, which basically round out those last three. So, uh, you say, oh, all of these sound really cool. How can I get it? Would help if I click. Uh, basically, um, once you do your update, you have a WSL config file, and uh, you have to have this experimental uh, chunk. And basically, you tell it what you want. Would help if I actually made. Uh, mouse movements here on the, the side that matters. Uh, you tell it what you actually want. So like say auto memory reclaim, uh, drop cache, net, networking mode mirrored, DNS tunneling true, et cetera. Now, the other thing is that's gonna break your heart is the last of these things uh, basically are all uh, dependent on you having uh, the, the pre-release uh, beta versions of Windows. So you have to be one of the Windows insiders. So we'll talk about them, but we won't be able to show them because like I said, uh, yeah, yes, Will. I was gonna pull, uh, mention one uh, feature which um, about uh, networking and getting experimental features and that kind of stuff. If you are trying to use um, the, any like uh, 
uh, WSL to local. And specifically, if you're on like a work system that has any DNS issues that you may be trying to, that you need to like play nice with, um, note that in your uh, resolve conf in WSL2, the first three entries are the only entries that it will find. So if you have 20 entries for your DNS, uh, for your, your DNS or your resolve conf, make sure that the one that you need are in the, only the first three because it won't read any of them after that. I ran into a thing where uh, resolve comps by default is auto generated. So you have to also disable that in the WSL Even comp. If it's auto generated, what you do is you just go back in and you blow it out, but also make sure that the first three lines also aren't white spaces or commented out. Hmm. Anyway, that's I just thought I'd share that with you because if you try to get started. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's part of one. <laughs> so uh, also the DNS tunneling may help. Because I think that that will pass it on to the the Windows side of things. But yeah, that was a good call out, Will. Uh, so, so if, for example, you have a DNS based ad blocker, would would using the DNS tunneling option do it for you? Would you also have to edit to resolve um, So I think the DNS tunneling would work for you. Basically, that just takes it in, uh, makes the Windows uh, DNS uh, configurations. Uh, the what it, it listens to is my understanding of it. But it, again, since they're uh, uh, those pre release sort of things, I, I haven't had a chance to play with it yet or to see how well it plays with something like uh, if you have an always on VPN yeah. uh, for yeah. one. <laughs> if you want to have a real bad time, uh -oh. uh, try and use a ZTNA with surf inspection on with WSL. Yeah, it sounds like a because they typically don't give a crap about WSLs to group CA. So what ends up happening is it just breaks all SSL everything. Yes, um, in weird ways. So what you have to do is to actually bring the the man in the middle search uh, CA uh, into WSL and add it to the the search uh, store. We're just run everything with tech K. Call it good. Don't duck it for sure. That's what I've done. It's unfortunate. Uh, yeah. Also, it can be DNS. It's most easily for it. Also, if you have a traditional VPN, it can get real interesting to get traffic routered or not routed. Because you kind of have to do the whack a mole game of like, let's spin up the VPN. Well, now the VLSL isn't working. Let's try killing the VSL and then booting it again. Okay, now it's on to the VPN. And then you disconnect the VPN. And then WSL is still trying to route through it. And then, like, yeah, so it's kind of a shock to get, like, kick WSL in the butt when you make a working change. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, so the, the other uh, thing is if you want to have the sparse uh, virtual hard drive stuff, uh, basically, uh, you can just say WSL double dash uh, manage the name of your distro, set sparse to true. And then uh, your virtual hard drive will become uh, uh, sparse uh, so that it will reclaim if you delete your files and stuff like that. Uh, so how do I update? Uh, you do WSL update and then uh, update for release. The first one's making sure you're up to the, the latest, greatest, and then you go Bed Bath and Beyond here into the pre release land. So if we pull up, over here and move this over here. Uh, so let's just go ahead and update. Uh, and let's make that a little bit bigger so those in the back can actually see, like me. Uh, so you do WSL, double dash, update. And it says we're already at the best and greatest. So then we go pre, pre release. What do you said for this to work? Yeah, the uh, Windows Insider builds. Uh, so no, you, you can take the updates, just some of the, uh, the new features that are uh, experimental like the uh, DNS and uh, 
Uh, the, those last, I think, like three options where you're like you got passing your Windows firewall rules on to the uh, Linux box or DNS or those things, you have to have the the insiders build installed. Uh, but you can take this WSL update uh, right now, and uh, you'll get like the sparse disk and the memory replay, which are nice options already. So as you can see, we've got 2.0.4. So there's been four releases since uh, last week when I updated and started this. And we're running the updates right now. And it was just that simple. Please. And it's now installing, I guess. It's a pilot. <laughs> yeah, so we'll let that work in the background here and we'll move on to the next uh, spot here to talk. Uh, so the latest couple of versions of uh, WSL2 uh, actually now have support for XORG apps in Wayland. Uh, Wayland? Uh, so basically, uh, Microsoft has a great documentation here of what you need to do. And basically, it lets you do fun things like launch your Linux apps directly from your start menu. Uh, you can pin Linux apps to the start bar. Uh, like I hinted, you can do Alt-Tab and uh, pin to the side uh, natively. And you also cut and paste works right, right across Linux as well. And what you need, you need uh, Windows 10, 19, 0, 44, or Windows 11, as well as you need to make sure you have your vGPU drivers uh, installed so that you get uh, uh, OpenGL uh, installed along with it. And you can do, uh, of course, Windows uh, WSL install or WSL update um, to, to get the latest updates. Uh, and if you don't have it, and of course, as a call out, it only works for WSL2. And okay, so we've eh, update failed. Okay, we'll just boldly go forward here. Let's go ahead and blow this up a little bit here. But so I've got the drivers already installed. And so if you're just wanting to run an XORG application here, and of course it pops up on the other window. But yeah, so here's XIs running on uh, Windows. And so if I hold down that Windows key and hit over, there you can see it pinned to the uh, left side of the screen. And let's go ahead and minimize it here. Back, well, uh, or full screen, but yeah. So anyway, though, as you can see, it, it works. It, it's so, I mean, you, you can even do weird, unholy things like, uh, let's see, do I have Firefox installed on this? Oh, no. Oh, so. You're kidding me, home. So, you can get away with. What is it? Uh, <laughs> yes, it looks like it is. <laughs> Okay, so what do you mean? I just <laughs> what? Why? I'm going to avoid. Don't do that to me. They're also running outdated bash, so that might be part of it. But... Okay, you know what? But let's try. Yes, oh. The demo gods are frowning. <laughs> okay, let's exit out of WSL. Okay, let's try reopening. Anyway, though, yeah, they, so this is always the, the fun when you go off script just to go messing with things here. But, okay, so 
Uh, let's see, let's run a different sort application. Yes, code. And of course, it has to install because it auto updates itself. Yay. And come on. Oh, unpacking. Okay. Let's make this a little bit bigger so people can see. And then, of course, VS Code should be popping up here. And it will be the uh, Linux version, which, of course, is. Does it run the Linux version in uh, GUI or like mine? I can run VS Code. It runs VS Code Server in WSL, but it actually runs Windows's uh, VS Code GUI. Uh, let's see what it's going to pop up as. It. Yeah, based on the yeah, based on the way that it's behaving, it if you pop a shell, it should tell you. Well, it should actually run the Linux shell either way. It should run the WS shell. Based on the way it's performing, I'm thinking it's actually running the the Xorg uh, uh, Windows or the the Xorg Linux uh, version of this. Yeah, you know, like, like taskbar. I um, say is it's coming up with all the shell extensions. Yeah, I know so, why well, that's not lighting in any way that it runs the VS Code server on the back end. Well, there's PowerShell right there. Yeah, 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 it's running on the Windows side, darn. But yeah, so anyway, though, it, it does give you a view into the, the uh, VS Code. Uh, we try Firefox here. Yeah, it's still wanting Snap. Due to being a lot of developers wanting to use Linux tools on Windows and use VS Code, they yeah, they got a lot of work on that a while back to uh, allow um, easy VS Code access. Because uh, you know, a lot of Windows 10 developers don't have the GUI anyway, so they have to have something that will allow that to work. So yeah, any, anyway, though, as you can see, you can run all sorts of goofy uh, GUI sort of stuff, and it works just fine. Ish. <laughs> wow. So, oh, because I didn't tell it what the image to play, uh, it's still in the fan line uh, version. But yeah, so anyway, though, long story short, you, you can do all that stuff. Uh, then the, the next uh, fun thing is if you want to get a full on. How are we doing on time here? Okay, yeah, we're skipper. So uh, there's a great stack of uh, documentation here that walks you through how to uh, XRDP. Uh, basically, they, this will let you have a remote desktop view of a full-on. Uh, so let's just go ahead and install Ubuntu desktop here, just because why not? Oh man, now you have to pick your desktop better. Yeah, so that, that's the thing here. You've got that. Oh, sorry. So while that's installing, we'll just keep going here. Uh, halfway through, we'll pick our uh, a light uh, desktop manager. And then basically, we just want to uh, install XRDP next. And then, so I mean, it's all fairly straightforward. 
while that's installing, we'll talk about the next thing that we'll be doing so that we're multitasking since uh, I, I do recognize we're, we're running a little later than uh, I'd initially planned on this. But uh, so one of the requests I know, uh, I think it was Jared, you'd asked if we could install SSH uh, daemon on WSL. And yes, you totally can. However, WSL is behind a NAT, so you can only access it from the Linux host or from the Windows host. And so, yes, you can SSH into it from the Linux, from the Windows box into the Linux. But uh, it doesn't really give you much. So you can't like firewall rule it into from an external. Except for that new, uh, where, where you can actually bring the uh, WSL onto your network directly, that new option that you need to be an insider's okay. uh, build. So now there is a workaround that you can install OpenSSH uh, on your Windows machine and then do run the, the command basically SSHing into it. Oh, so that's just Linux version PowerShell and WSL. Can you basically yeah. use your Windows as a jump Can you use JS Linux as your SSH? The the issue that you have is your your network. Uh, the, it's not exposed to anyone other than the, the your local host here, because it's behind a NAT. So, but what you could do is the full browser service. Yep, the Linux machine isn't exposed to your what the Linux. VM that runs is exposed to your neck. So things come in from outside. And it's, so JS Linux, it's a QEMU emulated computer running in JavaScript in your browser that has a full Linux with curl that works. Right? But yeah. It's it's insane. Insane. <laughs> but yeah, the so I mean yes, you, you could SSH from that into your WSL machine, right? You're running it on your local machine. There's nothing stopping you from yeah, doing that. So rich. I mean, but yeah, you're because Windows allow port forwarding, you could do something sketchy like that. Remember how I did it. I did make yeah, so part of the reason I asked is because I, I found lots of trouble and I have these open it. files and all of my like files for the new version. And yeah. that one, it's, it's like, like the version. Now that's it's like yeah. the the this was just moved so many times. I was like, hey, maybe you can figure this out. Yeah. So what you can do is you can do SSA you're running that SSH on your local Windows box, the, the SSHD. You could then do port forwarding to uh, bring, so you SSH onto uh, your Windows host with uh, the the proper connections to basically do a pass through onto your WSL. Okay. That, that That's one way that you can do it. But it, again, if you just, just wait a little bit longer, yeah. it, it's it's going to be possible a lot easier and it won't be nearly as happy as it's what. Mad. So that is, it's now the same. Yeah. Well, if you're trying to get inbound connections, this doesn't help because it's still. Yeah. I think there's an extension where you can store local files into the web, whatever. All the way through the insiders, whatever, to become better. But and then the the last thing. So uh, I mean, we can go through that, recognizing the the time limit and the uh, the, the fact that it's uh, of limited usefulness. To do SSH, uh, I, I'm just going to skip over that. You, you can follow the instructions. I mean, if you've installed SSHD anywhere else, it's not that hard. Uh, but let's check and see how our. Uh, okay, yeah, that's still working on that. So we'll just come back back to that because that I should have downloaded that that ahead of time. I blew away my VM. Uh, and reinstalled things after I uh, messed everything all up. So anyway, though, uh, USB over IP is the, the final uh, thing. And Microsoft has just an amazingly good set of documentation on how to make this work. Basically, what happens is you plug in your USB device here on your, your Windows host, and then using this uh, USB PD win uh, project, 
uh, you can forward the USB frames into the Linux world. And they uh, walk you through that you need uh, Windows 11, or with some hand waving, you can make uh, Windows 10 support work. And uh, you need a 64-bit uh, 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 non-ARM processor. And uh, you need WSL2 and a uh, recent uh, kernel. And uh, the reasoning behind why Windows 10 doesn't work is that you basically have to build your own uh, new WSL kernel that will play nice. And that's a lot of work. Plus, Windows 10 is going to be not supported here in a bit anyway. So, yeah, take, take the update. Yeah, it's sarcasm, but. Uh, is, there, is there a specific date for that? Uh, so, there, yeah. there is actually an end of life. It's October 25. Yeah, you know. Ten, 10 years from the original date, at least of 10. Standard. Standard Windows end of life. It's been that long. <laughs> yep. Yeah, it's had a good run. Uh, but so anyway, though, they do have that you can go and download it from their website, install the MSI, all those fun things. Or if you want to get with the, the new uh, the new way of doing things, uh, you can just use WinGet as well and use the Windows Package Manager, which is always fun. Okay, here we go. Yeah, whatever. I'm going to blow that away anyway. Uh, so, yeah, uh, let's just go ahead and do a WinGet here, WinGet install of the, uh, the package that we're looking for here. And yeah, I just, this is the first time I've used WinGet. I uh, was installing this, and I, I was actually pleasantly surprised at how nice of an experience it was. Is WinGet native? Yes, it is now. No idea. Okay. You tried WinGet UI? I, I haven't yet. Yeah. I put it on the other day. I really like it because it also automatically checks for updates and shows you packages that it's discovered that you need to update or can update. Is it not just the Microsoft Store? No. no. In fact, it pulls from many sources. Uh, NuGet, Microsoft Store, Windows Updates. Uh, it will pull Python Git. If you have Python installed, uh, actually, what else? You know what? Long, long as we're far off the rails already, we might as well take a look at it here. OK, so taking a look. Oh, of course you can then get it. <laughs> yes. So meta, let's go for it. Is this like a more native version of chocolate? Or yeah, uh, we, we, actually chocolate is one of the sources for it too. Um, so it's like somebody took the idea of chocolate and said, we're actually gonna actually try and implement this in Windows, Microsoft, Kubernetes, we're, we're gonna make this thing. Gotcha. Because I don't think chocolate really is like, Microsoft. like the homebrew stuff. It's yeah. Like, yeah. Um, this is Microsoft trying to legitimately add a big package manager. That's not the Windows Store that people might actually want to use, or at least people like us that are used to it. Oh, and it is giving me a UAC prompt, which would make sense. Sorry, they cracked me up that all the uh, all the more Linux advances in Windows and the OS prompt is still a doing only thing. Okay. The way they do it is very interesting. <laughs> actually, it's a brand new, it's actually, it's a brand new desktop. They call it they call it secure desktop. Like it's actually kind of hard to like get into the desktop by design. Yeah, nothing else will interact with it except like you went to the console. Mm -hmm. Use the permission to get real interesting. Because if you have something that needs to have local admin, but it uses the user variable, then it's useless to everyone else on the computer because it puts it in the 
to stop data instead of one thing to get to the end. Okay, so then we can go. Now, if you're running something that is supposed to live in user land, it should require added privileges. And right, like, so crappier rewritten things yes. that, are, that touch both places. There it is. Oh, wow. Or actors that did it. Sure. <laughs> Chocolatey scoop, when get hip. There's no select one. Uh, uh, Chocolatey thing. I can't oh. read it. Oh, you know what's a window scoop? They've got the next button. Yeah. No, no MPM. Do not button. do MPM. Yeah, so you can do NPM pip uh, dot net for a scoop. You know, let's just keep with the, the defaults for now. Uh, go ahead and give me a UAC prompt. Why not? Yeah, that's the only annoying thing is if you hit update and you have a whole bunch of packages, you better expect to get uh, randomly prompted as it hits a new package and wants to do an install. The, the graphics on this are just so it's fun. <laughs> they definitely spent all the money. <laughs> yeah, and so anyway, though, we completely far off the rails from what we had planned on, but yeah, so that, that actually seems borderline useful. Uh, yeah, so anyway, though, checking on our other updates. Yeah, I totally should have run this beforehand. Uh, apologies, but so yeah, anyway, though, that that's for uh, probably another yeah, looking at our time here. Uh, so yeah, let, let's just go ahead and kill that. That it, it's fairly easy to set up, and then you just essentially run your remote desktop uh, prompt from uh, Windows, and then just uh, the big thing is you have to change what IP address or what uh, uh, port you're uh, using. So if you have Windows desktop already set up, so that you you can screen share. Uh, your local uh, Windows, that way you're not colliding. But yeah, so anyway, though, that, that will be rough on another day here. But wow, you know, I thought I was obvious on some of my documentation. <laughs> that, that's <laughs> That's about the I, I, I've never actually made an application no. passively aggressively flash a red arrow where you should start it. But no, there's still going to be an end user that goes, I couldn't figure out. <laughs> I, so, question How big yes. of an arrow, uh, how big of a red arrow does it go from passive aggressive to just aggressive? <laughs> <laughs> you have to get the whole thing. Yeah, that last thing you messed up where you just flack out the whole window and arrow points and this is the search box. So if I click, say 70% of the screen. Like, like every team something. Yeah. Let me show you where they're at now. Right after you got used to the old one. Okay, so the moment you start typing in there, it, it actually does go away. But uh, yeah, there. Wow. <laughs> I, I'm. I'm so tempted to do that for the next application I make just to. <laughs> so, yeah, anyway, though. So, uh, yeah, uh, uh, USB over IP. Uh, because it, this part is kind of cool stuff. Uh, let's get the verification. Microsoft wrote a great article and it's fairly up to date. And so, like, like I said, we've installed and updated our stuff. And uh, the, so we've got the, the service that, that will run from the Windows side of things, the command line tool to interface with that uh, service, and then a firewall rule that lets uh, local uh, uh, IP addresses connect to it. And then uh, the next part here, we have to install uh, the 
uh, Linux side of things uh, over onto Linux, which could be a slight heck of it. Up here, so if we close that and then just reopen it, I hope that means that the world is a better place. And so then let's make this a little bit bigger. And we can go to apt, zero and paste. Oh, don't need us to do it because it already did. Yeah. I love how they just assume that you're not root. Right? Oh. <laughs> Uh, uh. Okay, since I know it's dead, is this that part of the tutorial here? Uh, yeah, so the, this is where you get around your uh, locks here by going, uh, let's just ls that folder. Since I exited it and it didn't give me a chance to, or it didn't clean up after itself, there should be that lock front end. So what you can do is go and just do a ORM. And now we should be able to do up to. That's the alternative you want to be at. Oh, and there's another lock there that we need to kill as well. Okay. Type. Oh, and of course, it's going to complain that there was a lock for a reason. I'm just impressed you were able to tell us what it said. EP AG. And of course, it's going to want to update, set up all those things that we already had spiked. So yeah, anyway, though, we'll, we'll keep talking about it here while uh, we're waiting for that to run. And uh, basically what happens is that uh, you can list all of the uh, USB devices that you have on your Windows host by uh, running this uh, WSL list command in your uh, uh, PowerShell here. And copy and paste. This view. Oh, you need to be in admin mode. That, that explains it. And that is not admin mode yet. So let's just go ahead and get us an admin. So oh. weird way you have to do it. I think if you shift right click the icon. Yeah, so because terminal light will yell at you for running the admin. And then speaking of that prompt, is to use to. I thought that it could have some types of admin mode and some types not, but maybe I'm wrong. It's in use. Let's make this a little bit bigger. And of course, since we're doing way too many things at once here. Yeah, but yeah, so there you can see all of the different USB uh, devices 
that are here. And so then at that point, you pick the one that you want to bring across over and in. Your keyboard. <laughs> uh, so then, then you take that uh, uh, bus ID that you have listed here, uh, and you run the, this command of uh, attach. And then uh, in Ubuntu, once all those things install, you uh, just uh, can run uh, uh, LS USB. And then once you're done with it, you can attach it as well. Okay, so. Does it work with everything? It's not the first time I looked this up. Just said it only works as like with like certain USB devices. I just gave him a, a combined Bluetooth and Wi-Fi card, so we'll see if it works with that. Yeah, so here we go. That'd be super awesome if it does. Then you could have a dedicated NIC. Yeah, this is WSL, and you could do SSH into it. You don't have to wait for all those updates that they were saying. Yeah, you know, I'm curious. I do have a USB uh, uh, network card at home. My number one use case, though, would be Unicode. Yeah. So I could have my FIDO back SSH keys. So I believe this one right here, generic Bluetooth adapter, real tech. So yeah, that, that would be the one that you'd want to run here. So one dash four. So we grab, want to attach and detach and paste. Watch out for your extra angle bracket. And then it was one, Dash four. And then let's see where we're at. All right, things. Oh, of course, that's still running. Uh, you're killing me. But yeah, so anyway, though, in theory, that, that should work uh, if you're not in the middle of trying to install uh, <laughs> a entire desktop package. Uh, that, that's what I get for not running uh, that command ahead of time uh, after wiping stuff. But uh, so the demo gods uh, have gotten their pound of flesh. But... Uh, yeah, we'll let that run here in a minute while, or for a few minutes while we're uh, having more shenanigans. But uh, RWSL USID. Currently, I need to reboot the machine or something. Yeah, they, this thing's all kinds of worked, but. And then you reboot it, that doesn't. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, in theory, that's Microsoft's instructions on how to do that. And it had been working, but uh, yeah, unfortunately, uh, even the, the uh, Android has questions. But uh, So at what yeah, point do you just, just say screw WSL2 and start using Linux? So, I mean, that, that would be the recommendation I'd have uh, if you can possibly do it if you have a spare machine sitting around. Uh, recognizing that some of us do serve corporate overlords that uh, do, while there are ways of making Linux work, it gets very uncomfortable to be a road warrior uh, using their VPN stuff while uh, uh, remote uh, uh, just because they, Linux is a second class citizen in uh, corporate IT's eyes. So it is possible, but uh, it's rough. Uh, but yeah, there's a reason why I have several uh, Linux boxes sitting down in the rack at home and or under my desk at work. So, uh, 
yeah, I WSL2 works great if you have no other options or if you want to do that one-off little thing that is easy. Uh, or if you just want to SSH into a real Linux machine. I will give you an example of So I'm a Linux admin at my office. We are forced to use Windows. They do not allow uh, the VPN client for Linux, so I cannot run a Linux machine. In a Linux. And I'm high So yeah, VM don't run Linux. Uh, and they've also restricted the ability to run almost any VM on the system. Except Hyper-V, that's the only hypervisor allowed now. And by the way, if you really want to mess up or potentially mess up WSL's networking, install WSL and then install Hyper-V um, because it will attempt to mess with that NAT um, switch that it basically. So the WSL instance and its switch are hidden. You can't actually see them once you install Hyper-V, but it will mess with them if you're not careful. So. I suggest if you're going to run Hyper-V on a machine and WSL, you install Hyper-V first, then set up WSL, and it seems to work better. But I live that uh, I live that life. I have to have WSL, uh, and I have to have Windows, and I have VPN. It works. It works. It works. It works. But I just like using things like cut and grep when I'm working with PowerShell AD stuff. Yeah, that, that is one of the nice things when you want to do that, just one quick Linuxy thing. Uh, just you, you pull it over across via Plan 9's uh, uh, file system uh, interop, and it, it usually works. Well, just sometimes fine. you don't even need Plan 9. So if you have a, in your organization, a lot of it, because again, policies and compliance and all that, but if you have a WSL, then you can basically pass PowerShell commands to it and then pipe them out to Grep and whatnot. Uh, the trick is that most of the like PowerShell AD commands actually output as UTF-16 LE. Um, so then you run it through icon to make it UTF-8, and then you do what you want to do with it. <sighs> I forgot about that Windows port. Yeah. UTF-16. UTF that's also what breaks the, like you're saying, if you um, pull something with Git in Windows or in Linux and you mess with them in the other environment, Git will hate you because anything you pulled with Git, if you have it configured wrong in Windows, which I do, it will pull it with the Windows line breaks. If you pull it in Linux, it pulls it with Linux line breaks. But then if you open it in Windows and it goes, Hey, all of your libraries changed. It will think all of your files have been modified. In oh, it just gets line by line. It's a hundred percent of the lines. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Or, oh. But, I, but, but the thing is, you open it in a diff editor, and you <laughs> because it doesn't highlight anything. It just right. looks like nothing's there. So what you need to do is you need to do the thing I mentioned in a form of like, which was. You just reverse the line ending. So instead of CR LF, you went everything with LFCR. I do know that, like, in the Git config for Windows, there's like three different modes you can do. Yeah. No, that plus plus is very amusing in that regard because it just sticks with whatever's there. Mm -hmm. um, so if you have a document that has both, it kind of doesn't know what to do and sometimes gets weird things. Well, then you may end up with weird like half completion issues and stuff at that point because it's it's going what are you doing to me? The other big problem is if you check something out and then you bring it across and run it in Linux from Win the check out in Windows, uh, it's a script, so like a Python script or something like that, or a bat bash shell script. Uh, everything will go wrong when you try and execute it because uh, the, the line returns are wrong. So it sees yeah. everything being on the same line and yeah, it, it, it just is bad. Yeah, and if you're running, if you're wanting to run Python scripts from WSL using VS Code and running the debugger, it will do it because it, it runs that VS Code server. It runs the VS Code in Windows. When you bring it 
thing you need to do to tell it to run the Python in WSL. You need to make sure it's connected to WSL. And then there's another thing too, if you're running like in a virtual environment, or a Python virtual environment, you have to make sure you pick the right one. Python virtual. It's, it's actually easiest to make a to make a virtual EMV like on WSL in VS Code. On the host, pick that virtual EMV, then it'll just use the right Python pass. It does once you have it all set up right, but it's very easy to like not get it right the first time. And VS Code tries to stick with that big, you have to dig out. It's yeah, I, I've been burned by that and been rather angrily grumped at by some developers on my team uh, that it wasn't uh, easy and obvious to just be able to use it wherever and yeah, that, that yeah. So long story short, uh, doing C-sharp development inside of VS Code, inside of WSL is uh, hard work. If you want to still be just going across the, the plan nine uh, file system uh, tri bridge. Here, I, I left my out. The best way to do it is do everything in WSL and then just use that remote extension and run VS, just use that use of the server. Just use yeah. the server, mm -hmm. everything's in VS, everything's in the WSL box. Don't touch, don't let Windows touch anything that that's launch, launch yeah. code from within WSL. Oh yeah. But, and then also keep all of your files in WSL as well. Yeah, in the WSL so pass. Yeah, yeah. Just treat it as if it's its own VM that has no ability to interrupt. And that, that was where we went off the rails. Uh, there's nothing wrong with working from this mount C. No, it's a, or from the or from the back 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 of WSL uh, chair. Yeah, yeah. You know, also the thing. Yeah, but I mean it, it does work just fine until it doesn't. CMake works great, but uh, the, the .NET uh, command line, no, it, it will hate you and it, it will rob your lunch money. <laughs> so there's a question. For the compiling part, should I do a comparison of performance running it in WSL? <laughs> Linux on the same hardware? It'd be interesting. Yeah, I, I'm curious on that. Let's see how much more terrible it is. <laughs> like, I think I have to figure out how to install WSL on something that may or may not have a valid license yet. <laughs> yeah, that would be any problem. Uh, yeah. I mean, the only thing so I can't change your desktop background. Yeah. You have to install WSL too. Yeah. I think that might be just logic right there. I don't know. You want to install WSL on having a Windows login? Like, I'm not sure what you want from the store now. I, I, I have a local login uh, and it works just fine. Yeah. Okay. You have to pull it from the store <coughs> if you're using GUI, right? Oh, that's right. The There's just a command line option. Yeah. yeah. And the Disney commands actually have like multiple tildes in the command string, which is because you, you look up the documentation and you go, oh, this is a formatting error. I'll just copy the part they meant to paste. And then it doesn't work. There's like a double or triple tilde as part of the actual system installation command. Also, it's very, very amusing because it's like a hybrid of a PowerShell command and a command prompt command. So the camel case and everything looks like a PowerShell and like the hyphenations, but everything is a slash parameter, like old school command prompt. And it's it's scary. You basically have to look it up online and copy and paste it and hope for the best because it's a jam. Yeah, that's an example of that in Slack. Yeah. So one other neat thing I've done with WSL, I don't know if it's neat, somebody might shoot me for this, um, but because I use the same SSH keys in Windows and in Linux, um, specifically for GitHub and things, I took the time to figure out how to basically map my uh, SSH folder from Windows, not SSH folder from my Windows user account to my Linux one, which normally also complains about permissions. So if you go into the WSL comp and add an options metadata, um, 
It will allow you to put window or Linux ACLs on the Windows folders. And then you can do an LNS from your Windows user.ssh to your phone. <laughs> Save some time for, and you can copy keys, but if you ever have to update them, you have to remember you got to change. <laughs> What situations did you do you need to use an SSH client on Windows instead of like the Windows? Um, I do use GitHub on Windows to develop for different things. So that way, ES Code has access to it in the Windows or to the experience. That's most of it. Um, technically, sometimes I do actually SSH out of PowerShell to different things because you can do that. Also, you can an actual nice SSH. I don't do I have to drill out there like there's a real curl just sitting around in there. Um not unless you've installed if you so here's the fun thing. If you install Git for Windows, it installs a bunch of Linux tools, right? And they're actually the Linux tools. I found this out the hard way because then I went onto a new machine and tried to do something I had done before using a Linux tool and it complained that Windows was wrong. There are a number of Linux tools Windows emulate like curl that actually run um, invoke request or invoke web request on the back end and they use different switches because they're not. No, in CMD, it's an actual honest to God curl. But in PowerShell, it's the alias. Yeah. Yeah, it's aliasing some partial command. Yeah, that, yeah. yeah. But until you install Git, then it overrides. Yeah, but, but in actual, like, in normal stock Linux, CMD, there's actual curl. And then I was looking at like do oh, we have, there's like a there's like a system there's like a system like, I, can, like, I, I can I can yeah yeah there's actually a curl called IXE you know, yeah. that's whatever curl and I had to do this but again where I need the real curl and so I had to hard code the, the real curl mm -hmm. uh, and it had different syntax which is annoying as hell yeah yeah and then the thing is like people try to go contact the curl project about it it's like no 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 no. Uh, Microsoft about that. Yeah. I actually got that typed right. Yeah. It depends on what my life is there flashing for my eyes and having to code something in Python that emit PowerShell to run on a remote box to do a bunch of stuff, get it back. Oh, that sounds horrible. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so like crowd might get mad at you for doing sticky things like that. It forces you to do that. <laughs> I was able to dump the entire RAM off the, the Windows box then. Yeah, I I triggered stuff before for running like uh NetCat. What? I, I triggered uh, uh nannies before for running the uh, NetCat oh. uh, command. I triggered uh, IT security the other day by trying to install um, mm -hmm. Allen WSL. That's why you installed Allen. I'm like, they need a separate WSL instance. This was on the desk. They could one better. They got upset at me because I uploaded Rust for your cells. <laughs> IT security likes getting upset with a lot of things. They, and especially, they, they loved it because I did it from the, the um, I looked at like the public GitHub tarball. So, yeah, you okay. have to know if I'm just apply all with uh, white text on a white background with the icon string. <laughs> <laughs> See how long it takes people to hit that with those numbers? They're putting a string scanner on every curl that you do in a box. Who is this? You pass an open ID, then it's named something else, like Jabberwocky. <laughs> I mean, DPS scanners are FUD. I was in a previous place of employment where I was playing with their scanner, but I was doing nested zips. And I can make this go out to a crawl because it was trying to, like, in real time, oh. out like, of the network, unzip. <laughs> there wasn't even, like, a zip file. It was just some zip files with large files nested inside each other. And it was just not having it.